Ladies and gentlemen, today we're offering a brand new course, one that is surely coming to schools, colleges, universities, teacher training centres and classrooms around the world. It is our pleasure to present and importantly discuss the Psychology 101 or ELT course, that's English language teaching. Now, if you are an English language teacher or indeed any teacher, someone interested in psychology or indeed any learner, this podcast and course is for you. So stick around. It is my privilege and honour to welcome James Edgerton, the mind behind the course to my channel. Additionally, a warm welcome to everyone in the premiere, somewhere over here maybe. Let us know by commenting where you're watching from, where are you from in the world? Uh, we'd also love to know your experience, that is, this is not just about ourselves, we need to hear from you. What's your native language and which languages have you taught or learned? Also a warm welcome to those watching in the replay, it's great to have you here too. Should we happen to be meeting for the first time, I'm Alistair and this is Al's Action English, it's great to have you here. If you are interested in English languages or accents, consider subscribing. Having reached 800,000 views, a huge thank you to everyone. That's a great milestone. Thank you. It's high time for our second podcast. Enough rambling from me. Let's hear from the main man. Welcome, James. Perhaps you could introduce yourself and give us an idea about your experience with languages. Yeah, Alistair, thank you very much for having me on. It's uh, a real pleasure. So my name is, is James Edgerton. I'm from a small town near London originally. Uh, and I've been teaching English for almost a decade now since I left university. So I've worked in Spain, uh, in Latvia, where we work together at IH Riga. And currently I work at uh, International House Rome, uh, where I'm also a CELTA tutor, so a, a teacher trainer on the, on the CELTA course, which um, Many people in English language teaching will have taken as a as an entry course, a pre service course. So um, I also studied French and Spanish at university. So you know I come at this from two angles, if you like, from the, the learning perspective and and from the teaching perspective. So everything that I um, tell my students, it's because I've used it and applied it myself when I've been learning languages, which I think is really important. You know, a lot of a lot of people can and talk the talk, but it, it really adds an extra layer of authenticity and, and validity if you walk the walk beforehand. Brilliant. Thank you for, for introducing yourself. Let's let's explore that a bit more. How how does this vast experience and from the teacher side and the learner side, how does this help you as a teacher trainer and how did this help you sort of put this brilliant course together? Good question. It helps me as a teacher trainer because, well, I can I can pass on perspectives from from two different angles, right? So I can, of course, empathise with with learners. I think most of most people I've met in the world of ELT, as you said before, English language teaching, most people that I've met are learners themselves in some capacity, whether that's having learned English as a second language or another language, you know, living in a, in a different country around the world. So I'm definitely not um, not not alone in that. There's nothing original really there, um, but it it does help me to to like I said to empathise with the the struggles of the learner and the difficulties. And your second question was, well, how did how did that help me to put together this course, this Psychology 101 for ELT course? Well, I saw that there is a large gap, a large blind spot in. Um, in mainstream teacher training, and and this gap for me is is in the world of, of psychology. And psychology is such a, a broad term, um, broadly defined as the the science of thought and behaviour. So it, it really is fundamental to everything we do. It's not just about language learning. Um, and and I suppose it also my my belief that you have to be working with the whole person in a in a holistic sense also feeds into my motivation to to run this course because if you don't understand the whole person you won't be able to help the whole person 
if you don't understand somebody's one session that we'll talk about later the teenage brain if you don't understand about somebody's cognitive development you're going to be tripping up constantly and you're going to be confused constantly about things <clears throat> that with the right information with the right knowledge you, you'll be able to at least empathize with so yeah i think i think good teaching is about teaching the whole person teaching you know the, <clears throat> the individual in, in all their idiosyncrasies and, and psychology and, and a at least a basic understanding of psychology is, is a really important aspect of that. Brilliant. Thank you for highlighting about the gap and, and the whole person. When we get stuck into the sessions uh, shortly, we'll really have the opportunity to explore those. So to the viewers, to everybody listening, this, if my understanding is correct, is about filling a gap in teacher training and in learning. This, this applies to everything. And we're really excited that this course is, is going to do the best it can to fulfill and to fill in that gap. Absolutely brilliant. Go on. Sorry, sorry to jump in there, because you did mention earlier, the course is predominant, predominantly for uh, English as a foreign language teacher, <clears throat> English as a foreign language teachers. But um, of course, it is applicable to other kinds of teachers. I, I, I'd say about 90% is applicable to all kinds of learning and teaching. So. You know, somebody's out there and they and they teach physics, for example, um, then and they think that the that the material might be useful for them. I would say it definitely would be. Now, this is where I have some experience. I was privileged to take part in the first offering of this course three years ago, I believe. Yeah. And having taught maths myself uh, as well as English, and now doing some accent coaching, this absolutely is applicable to anyone who's a teacher, and particularly those learners who are interested in learning and about psychology. So I highly recommend it. James, how did the first offering of this course sort of play out? It was three years ago. Yeah, because that was during our time at IH Riga uh, in 2018. So I can't remember the day that I decided that I was certainly going to, to, to carry out the course. I, I remember having it in the back of my mind for quite a while. Um, and of course, I, I was involved in, in the teacher training, the in-house teacher training, IH Riga. And I think one day I just decided, well, what are you waiting for? You, know, you, you could be waiting for years and years for a good idea to become a great project. You know, for, and, and you just have to take that risk and take that step forward and say, it's, it's not going to be perfect first time, but I'm going to try my best. And, and then we've got something to work with and improve for the next time. So I, I've always been passionate about psychology and, and teaching. And I just saw it as a, as a good opportunity to, in, in my last few months at IH Riga. So I really wanted to put it into practice um, while I had the chance. Brilliant. And here we go, an up, updated version, which we're, we're all really pumped about. While we're here, just briefly before we get stuck into the to the sessions that'll be involved if people are interested how do they contact you when's this happening please sure so um we're actually starting tomorrow so uh, the, the podcast is going out on monday monday the 21st the first session is on tuesday the 22nd of june and it runs well uh, you you'll put the 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 website link in the in the show notes, I believe, so you can see the exact dates. But most Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, and there are eight sessions in total. So it will be in Central European time because I'm currently in Rome from six p.m. till seven thirty p.m. on those Tuesdays and Thursdays. The, the great thing about the course, I know I'm biased, but one of the things that I'm really excited about on the course is that it's not like a normal course where you have to sign up to the whole thing or you can't sign up to any of it. So I've actually created an option where, where people can sign up to just parts of it. So if perhaps they're, they're really, really busy this summer and they have lessons on certain days and they can only make two or three of the sessions, that's absolutely fine. If perhaps, you know, they've had a long academic year and they're pretty tired and they're really just interested in two or three sessions, that's absolutely fine. So I'd really encourage people to, to, to give it a go. And then I'll be running the course again in the autumn. So, you know, perhaps the, the sessions that people haven't done, they can they can make them up there um, later on. So there's um, it's quite a flexible option in that sense. They can people can take all eight sessions, or they can take odd sessions, pick a mix as they you know, as suits their timetable. 
excellent. James's email is in the notes in the description and the link to the, his blog post for more detail also in the description. Just to reiterate, if you're in the premiere, this starts tomorrow. This is hot off the press. And if you're watching the replay, also welcome. Get in contact with James. It'll be in the autumn. It'll be in the coming years. This course is the future. And I'd like to just outline what our structure is today for this podcast. So it's as follows. So next, we're going to answer the vital questions of why this course, James has touched on it, and why psychology is important in teaching and learning. Following that, and this is the meat of the podcast, James will guide us through the eight sessions of the course. Now, during this section of the podcast, be sure to ask any questions you have in the premiere chat or in the comment section if you're watching the replay. Now, if there are no takeaways, and actionable points, then what's the point in a podcast? Or indeed a course? James would be the first to admit that. So after discovering the eight course sessions, we'll spend some time further developing what are and your takeaways are from this podcast. Finally, we'll round things up, answer any questions from the Premier chat and confirm exactly what you need to do next after the podcast. And I should point out that in the YouTube description below, somewhere down here, and the little video time bar if you're on mobile. There are detailed timestamps for your convenience so you can go straight to the chapters that are most relevant to you. So let's move on. So James, why, why are you running this course? Could you expand about this gap, in the interest sure. in psychology? Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you started with why, Al, because as you know, we're, we're, we're both big fans of this, uh, <clears throat> this concept of start with why. Um, if you don't have a good reason for why you're doing something, then the how and the what won't make any sense and you won't be aligned in, in the right direction. So why? That's, that's the first question I asked myself before I offered the course for the first time. And it's definitely the, another question that I asked myself when I, when I decided to um, make a reincarnation of the course this time. <clears throat> why am I doing this course? Um, well, as I, as I mentioned before, I think there's a, a large gap in, in mainstream teacher training on uh, basic understanding of, of psychology. Uh, and that could be behavioral psychology. It could be about the learning process, so, so the, the cognitive side of psychology. But of, of course, they're all intertwined. You know, in each session, we're going to divide um, you know, divide it into eight eight parts. But of course, <clears throat> for example, the group dynamics and your own personal motivation are very much intertwined. What's happening in the teenage brain and the cognitive development and your motivation are very much intertwined. So everything uh, is everything is a very dynamic system, which which in which a small change in one causes change in all the rest. So I, I hope that we, we can also explore that during the course, that you know, we, ha we have to focus on one thing per session, but the, as you said before, the holistic experience of, of language learning is very, very complex, and, and everything, um, everything plays a role simultaneously. Um, so yes, to, to go back to the original question, I think it's a really, really important part of learning and I think it's also a really important part of teaching so we'll be, we'll be applying the information to how we deal and, and how we treat our students how we deal with our students I, I should say but it also has huge ramifications for the classroom and how you teach your how you how you teach how you treat your fellow teachers um, uh, and colleagues how you treat yourself, how you understand your own motivation, your own why, you know, how you feel as part of the group in your work environment. So there are, there are many layers where I think this would be really, really useful for the teaching professionals. Yeah, thank you for expanding. May, may I give a bit more information about the, the golden circle, the why that you touched on? Oh, always. Brilliant. James and I, we, we love this. <laughs> Simon Sinek. Uh, wrote a brilliant book called What's Your Why? James has touched on it. 
And in this, he describes the golden circle, your what, your how, and your why. And Simon Sinek, I think in a TED talk, comments how lots of people start with their what. What is it I do? Some people start with their how, but very few people really get to the crux of the matter, get to the center of this circle with their why. You can see the images on screen that Simon talks about. He then gives the example of Apple, which I will quote if I may. Obviously a very successful company. This is their why. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. That's their how. We just happen to make great computers. It's a way of thinking. I believe that what James is offering is a course. But what we've had the privilege to listen to just now, what you've had the privilege to listen to, is the why. It's so much bigger. It's so much more important. Thank you for, for giving us this, this insight, James. Thank you, Al. And, and if I could just tag on a little bit to that. Um, I mentioned earlier that I'm a CELTA course tutor, and CELTA is the, the biggest sort of pre-service teacher training course for English as a foreign language teachers. <clears throat> um, what we deal with on that course, because it's a very, very short course, uh, over, over 20 days, you really deal with the what because that's all we have time for. We don't, we don't have time to go into the depths. Um, the what and a little bit of the how, but the, the why and the, the, the psychological rationale behind the procedures is really what allows you to then be more creative in your own teaching practice and your own lesson design. So the things that we will, will go into on the Psychology 101 for ELT course will really get into that why, and that's where all the gold is. Let's kick off, James. It's over to you. Right. Number one. Okay. So yeah, there are eight sessions on the course, as I mentioned. We'll, we'll be running until about the 20th of July. So as we said earlier, if you can't make it tomorrow, that's absolutely fine. You can even jump in on the, on the last few sessions if you're listening to this podcast, you know, um, in, in, mid, in mid-July even. Um, so there are eight sessions. I'll, I'll just go through them very, very quickly, and then we'll, we'll talk about each one. In, in more detail. So it's the core concepts in educational psychology, number one. Number two, mindset theory. Number three, memory and attention. Number four, building group dynamics. Number five, motivation and engagement. Number six, the teenage brain. Number seven, beating exam, in brackets, anxiety, beating anxiety. And number eight, optimizing revision technique. So we'll start at the beginning, like all great stories. Um, core concepts in educational psychology. Um, so without giving the game away completely and uh, giving, giving everyone the information that we're going to be looking at on, on the course, what we're going to look at are some core, um, core theories involved in, in, in education, but especially in English language teaching, in, well, let's say in second language acquisition. Um, but not only looking at it from a theoretical point of view, looking at how what we do in the classroom is often a direct reflection of these different theories without us noticing it. So just to give you one example, um, one theory is behaviorism, which comes from, so many of your, your, your listeners will be familiar with Pavlov's dogs and Skinner's rats. Back in the 40s and 50s, I believe the, the experiments were. So. Pavlov with his dogs will will train these dogs to salivate when they hear a bell. So there's a stimulus and a response. That's the that's the core of it. And so behaviorism in terms of second language acquisition comes from that. So um, the core principle there is that language is learned through imitation and uh, repetition of what we observe other people doing and saying. which is fine. I think, well, okay, what's, what's the connection to what we do in the classroom? Um, so the idea that the teacher has to be a model 
not just for language, but also for culture, um, for, you know, pragmatic application of the language, how, how formal they are in how they talk to the students, for example. That comes from behaviorism, that the teacher should be an example for the, for the students to follow. Um, so once you get down into the weeds, we're going to be looking at five different theories, which is by no means a, an exhaustive list. Um, we're going to touch briefly on how they um, how they correspond to each other, but how how they also disagree with each other, <clears throat> because of course, you know, each theory offered a new uh, perspective on how a second language uh, and a, in, in fact how a first language is learned. Uh, and then also, and then we're going to try and apply it to to, to the classroom um, techniques that we're all familiar with. Even if we've just taught for a couple of hours in our in our EL, ELT careers, we we all know the air quotes correct way of doing things. Uh, you know, according to a CELTA perspective, and I think it will be a really interesting session to see how those are actually embedded in decades and decades of of academic research and the theories. That, that have come out of that. Lovely introduction. The only point I'd like to add here, James, if I may, is mm. my PGCE. So I trained as a maths teacher. We studied Vygotsky and Piaget. I can't remember if they, if they, if you touched on them in the course three years ago. And we had to do a a module on on this in the PGCE. And unfortunately, most of the teachers approaches it as theory only mm. which i can understand i'm not saying i agree with it but theory only mm. and i tried my best to apply it to the classroom so i did my module and actually took it into the classroom that i was training in it's very difficult because theory and practice sometimes you don't feel they come together yeah, together. yeah. But that would be the one thing that right at the outset in session one at it's worth highlighting this this course is not just theory it's not just practice it it's about bringing them together and it's about having having takeaways mm, absolutely yeah it's also i mean it will be a good point to mention that people who participate in the course will not just be learning from me they'll also be learning from their fellow participants and as i'm speaking to you now um we have already Teachers signed up. I'm super excited about this. We have teachers from uh, Italy, uh, Latvia, Hungary, Kenya, Australia, the UK. We have teachers from all over the place. And it's, and it's great because teachers in different contexts, different cultures have different experiences. And so there'll be plenty of opportunity to share experiences with other teachers. Um, and I'll also be learning tons from the people that, that come and, and you know, offer their ideas and offer their stories. So that's another layer of, of what we'll be learning on the course. Excellent. Shall we go to session two? Yes, we shall. So number two is next. <clears throat> so that will be on Thursday, the twenty fourth. Um, you, you're going to have to stop me when uh, you've had enough hour because I could I could wax lyrical about <laughs> this for seven to ten days without a break so this is mindset theory session two mindset theory i think this is absolutely fundamental not just to how we see ourselves how students see themselves how we all approach the learning process also how we treat ourselves um, when we fail and how we look at failure um, and this applies across the board. I actually came in contact with mindset theory thanks to a good friend of mine called called Aaron. He's a, a very a very prestigious golf coach in the UK now. So it was from a sports science point of view, um, and it applies across the board. Learning an instrument, any skill, um, basically you can see the you can see a skill through the lens of a growth mindset, and you can see the skill you can see a skill through the lens of a fixed mindset. Many details that we'll look at during the sessions, during the session, but very, very briefly, uh, a growth mindset believes that skills are improvable, even though, of course, you have a genetic base, yes. you know, yes. we're not denying that, but they are imminently improvable from there. Everybody has a large 
um, a large scope of possibility. Uh, whereas a fixed mindset believes that all traits and abilities and skills are are, are genetics or are, are, are given from birth, so, which is, is a terrible thing for language learning because the first thing, the first day that you make a mistake, which you inevitably will if you're pushing yourself beyond what you already know, the message there with a fixed mindset is, oh, well, that just shows that I haven't got what it takes. Big thumbs Super down. negative. Exactly. And it's really, I mean, we know from experience the difference between teaching people with more of a growth mindset. It's a spectrum, you know, it's not labeling people yay or nay, of course it's a spectrum, but people with a stronger growth mindset, they, they love challenges. They, they thrive under the challenge. They learn from each other because nobody else is a threat. They're just offering possibilities of how you can improve and it changes the environment. We'll also tie into group dynamics from which is another session later on. Whereas with a fixed mindset, it's really hard work. It feels like you're wading through mud, just trying to help them get to the very basic point so um yeah i think it's absolutely fundamental and and not just for students for teachers not just for our language learning for all kinds of learning um how how, how have you applied it out i know that you you're also a fan brilliant i'm going to share one word that's all mm -hmm. uh the word yet <sighs> and Again, the word yet is a mindset. It's not a word. <laughs> that's, that's the key. Uh, we'll put some links below, maybe some uh, sc screenshots on, sh on screen at the minute. Carol Dweck, she's the, she's the one to go and look out for, for this one. But the word yet shows your students and yourself that learning is a journey. You're here, but you're trying to get here. Uh, you haven't uh, mastered this advanced concept yet you're just mm -hmm. you're just stating a fact and so my takeaway in this course is eminently practical practical is the word yet makes a difference and the precision of the language of the teacher and the learners can improve the mindset of the entire class this is a practical thing so hey if you're listening now start introducing the word yet into the way you deal with yourself and other people. Mm. Massive change. It just flicks a switch. Brilliant. Really? Yeah. So, so if you, if I, I could say two examples and I have completely different messages, I could say, oh, if you're listening to this, you haven't signed up to the course. Number two, if you're listening to this and you haven't signed up to the course yet, it is, it, 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 it shifts the focus from the perceived failure to the perceived possibility um, to go from where you are to where you could be. Absolutely paramount. And as you mentioned there, Al, again, same concept as with, with the first session. It's not just theory. We're going to be looking at many ways that you can put this into, into practice in your classroom. Even with the small things that you say to students, not just yet, but how you give praise, how you give feedback on their work, uh, how you correct mistakes. There are, there are many, many small things that make a big difference. We could talk about correcting mistakes, error correction, <laughs> <laughs> till, till the course in autumn. <laughs> yes. Let's move on to number three, James. I want to introduce this one with a question, with a comment and then a question for you to give you the floor. So everybody listening to this podcast, again, welcome if you're in the premiere. Welcome if you're on the replay. Let us know where you're from. What's your experience of psychology? What languages are you learning? What languages are you teaching? We want to hear from you. Everyone knows the importance of memory and attention, session three. Maybe you could give us an idea of one practical thing that could be done in this regard for teachers and learners without giving the game away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um... Okay, one thing that I would recommend to everybody in this, um, in this sphere is understand the limits of cognitive load and be realistic with what you're trying to learn in each learning session. So our working memory is very limited. Excuse, excuse me, James, cognitive load. Could, you, could yes. you clarify, please? Yeah, so cognitive load, how much novel information we can hold in our minds at any one time. So working memory is, is a science and 
the calculations have been done from the experiments, and it seems that we can hold between five and nine new vocabulary items in our mind in each learning session. Okay. Um, cool. which, which means that if you're studying, or in that case, teaching vocabulary, then be, be limited. It's better to study eight new words in, in, in detail and, and to really learn them than to try to do 15 or 20, in which case the, the cognitive load is, yeah, cuts out pretty much like you've, I think of a, think of a metaphor. It's like um, you, you, you've literally, you've got a horse and carriage. I don't know why this has come to <laughs> mind now in 2021, but you've got a horse and carriage. And instead <laughs> of pulling eight new words up the hill, um, you've, you've tried to throw some extras in because you think, oh, while we're here, we'll just do some extras. And you've just stopped the horse dead in its tracks. It's not going to move an inch. So do yourself a favor, understand that simple concept, and be realistic with how much you're trying to learn in each session. Um, in terms of attention, um, we could talk on and on about this. One phrase that I really enjoy from Jordan Peterson is, what you look at determines what you see. What you look at determines what you see. And how that applies to the classroom is that how we are helping to guide our students' attention really makes all the difference in what they take away from the course. But we should also be mindful that we can't force students' attention onto certain aspects. We can merely encourage it. And every student will come away with different things from each lesson. So I remember, Al, in, um, in Riga, you often had post-it notes by the door at the end of the class. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Is this something I did or other people? Well, I think, I think it was, I, I definitely noticed it in your class. You, perhaps you're not the only one, but you yeah. used it quite regularly, I think. So I think it's quite a common tactic. I think this is applicable to all subjects. So towards the end of the lesson, there's a few ways you can do this. You would encourage students to write something they've learned today. For younger, younger students, it would be to write a new word or draw a picture. For maybe more advanced students, it would be to write a question. And you'd put these sort of around the whole room. Everybody would go and look. And they're, they're having, as they leave, as they leave on a high, which James might talk about later, uh, they're being bombarded, not over bombarded, but they're being refreshed with everything that's gone on. Because each, uh, each student in the classroom, irrespective of subject, is going to take away something different. Rather than, okay, lesson over, goodbye. You leave on a high. You leave with their super engaged. Mm -hmm. Lovely. It's a lovely little. And, 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 and I suppose that's, that's the link between memory and attention. What you, where you place the spotlight of your attention is most, it, 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 it ties into what you're most likely to remember, right? So um, that's why I put those two concepts together in the same session. Just to lead on to the fourth section, which I'm going to introduce, you'll also hear about memory palaces on this part of the course and kind of connected memories linked to your senses. I'm not going to say anything more, just a teaser. Okay, number six. You're, sessions, tempt, you're tempting me out, but I, I will also keep still. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have to do a bit of that, I think. <laughs> Session four. Some of you may be familiar with Norman Schwarzkopf. Storman Norman, he was called. Uh, I believe he was a US general during the Vietnam War. We're not going to discuss the merits of that war in this podcast, thankfully. Storm and Norman. Session four is group dynamics. And what I remember from this uh, part of the course is Storman, Norman, forming and performing. Storming, norming, forming and performing. James, you're close. You're close, though. You got them in slightly wrong order. Wrong order. Okay, that's all right. We we form forming first, then storming, then norming, then performing. So um, yeah, they're each they're each broad stages of um, what happens in a group. Or why is this important? If you can think of an experience 
where you have felt like a really important integral part of a group and an experience in which you were doing something in a group like a team sport and you didn't really feel part of it the motivational pull of being part of a group is absolutely huge i think as teachers and as learners we need to tap into our evolutionary biology as much as we can and we are group animals we're social animals so if we can harness the power of a group even if you've got three or four students in the class it's still a group and understand the the features of how a group forms how the trust is built slowly over time and what you can do as a teacher to try and encourage that process <clears throat> the difference is is massive not just for the students but also for you and how much you enjoy what you're doing um, with with the students so that theory is from from tuckman or one of the versions is from tuckman and then for each of the four stages forming storming norming and performing um, hersey and blanchard came up with a leadership style which is most appropriate so we'll also be touching on when a teacher should be more more of a teller when a teacher should be more of a participator when it when the teacher should be more of a seller you know to convince the students and then when the teacher should be more of a delegator and each of these leadership styles correspond to a stage of the group uh, dynamics so I'm, I'm really really um really passionate about sharing that because that is such a fundamental part of any group environment also don't forget the, the, the staff room your work environment is also a group environment um, and, and, and it's something which I haven't seen anywhere else without without blowing my own horn I haven't seen it anywhere else in, in mainstream teacher training or, or, or any of the of the mainstream courses that are on offer at the moment um, and I suppose what you touched on earlier was, Al, was the peak end rule and, and, and we'll, we'll be going into that in group dynamics the so when you talked about the post-its <clears throat> that your memory of an event is mostly formed with the peaks, so the, the, the highest emotional moments, and most importantly, how the experience ends. So we can all think of a film that we've seen, and maybe for one hour, 55 minutes, it was great, but the ending was awful. Somebody asks you the next day, how was that film? Do you recommend it? Even if, well, you're, the, you're the mathematician now, but even if, would that be? 90, 95% of the film was fantastic. If the ending is no good, your memory of the whole thing uh, goes into the shadow. So really important that we, we apply that, not just to single lessons, but also to end of course protocols. And we, we finish on a high so that students come back next, the next time with a lot of motivation and, and a lot of energy. Life lessons, not just course lessons. Absolutely. I even, I mean, we're not going to go down this rabbit hole, but even, for example, relationships. <laughs> Most, a lot of, I mean, because relationships don't usually, <laughs> he's going to edit this out, because relationships don't usually finish on a high, at least for one of the, one of the people involved, we are tricked by the peak end rule to remember the whole relationship in a negative light. Whereas for most of for most functioning relationships it's actually a great experience most of the time the fact that it ends well does affect your memory of the whole thing though uh, sorry the fact that it ends badly affects your memory of the whole thing definitely yeah definitely so yeah life lessons as you say yeah we need, we need to ask a question please if you're in the premier what's what's your experience of group dynamics from work from the classroom whatever we, we'd love to hear from you have you had positive experiences negative experiences what role did the teacher play what role did your classmates play james and i would love love mm. to hear from you may i move on to to the next one Please. this one is entitled let me just check my notes here motivation and engagement motivation and engagement now having taught maths having taught english now doing some accent coaching i believe every teacher would say motivating your students and having them engaged is like the holy grail of what you want. Yeah. So James, why is the psychology of motivation <laughs> and engagement never spoken about? Please. <laughs> uh, I, I can't speak. I can't speak for for this. I don't know why. 
I, I can't work it out because all of the studies... It's so important. <laughs> I mean, all the studies that have been done in, in second language acquisition say that motivation is the number one factor in people's achievement. So even if you're, you know, even if you're just looking at the numbers at the end of the course and the marks and the, and the even if you're the business person behind the, the, the language school and you're just interested in people getting the certificates, you have to go to motivation first in order to power the whole process. It really is the, the boiler house. It's the, it's, the, it's the engine of the whole enterprise. And the question that you asked there, I was fascinating because you're right. Often students, will, uh, sorry, often teachers will ask, how can I motivate my students? And I, I think that's the wrong question. I think we should be asking, how can I allow my students to motivate themselves? Or how can I allow my students, exactly, how can I allow my students to find their motivation? which will be different for every single individual. Um, teaching English, we really have a, an embarrassment of riches in terms of motivation because there's so many things that our students will be doing in English, whether it's you know, watching films or playing video games with people around the world and speaking in English. So many things that you can do with English that we, we just need to offer the framework to students and they will find the motivation. Um, also, without giving the game away again, there's some fascinating research from Nottingham University where I'm taking my master's in, in applied linguistics from a researcher called Zoltan Donier, originally from Hungary. And he talks about the, the absolute paramount importance of language learning and personal identity and how we can use that to increase motivation. So he's in this session, we'll, we'll, we'll go over this concept. It's called the L2 motivational self system. There are different aspects to it. There's a, there's, a, there's a push and a pull. So you create a kind of a little heaven that you want to strive for and a little hell that you want to avoid. And, and we have to deal with both of these things in motivation. It also factors in, in internal and external motivation in this system. Um, but yeah, self-identity. Who instead of asking what do you want um, with the language, we should be asking students who do you want to be with the language, and it's a huge motivating factor. Thank you. Immediately, it's just come to my mind. Here's another takeaway from watching this podcast: the questions you ask in the classroom from a teacher or a learner, the questions you ask in life, often define where you're going. Take care to ask good questions. Absolutely. The greatest thing that was ever said in any of my teaching experience, and this again I think shows the importance of motivation, it was an external Ofsted inspector in school back in England. That, that doesn't matter. But what they said was basically, Alistair, Mr. McCarty, you don't have to be in the classroom. They're just getting on with it. And I went, brilliant. The focus had shifted from me to them, and that that might be it, James. Is that a bit too much? But you, you know what I mean. That might be. No, no, it's, it's not too really much. Really it's not too much at all. That's exactly it. Because, <clears throat> well, exactly what you said. What question? What question are we asking of ourselves and of our students? The question that I ask is, what can I do to facilitate students' motivation continuing, not just beyond. The walls of this classroom or the hours that they that they have to be here but beyond the course you know even years down the line when i don't see them what can i do to help them stay motivated and stay engaged in the learning process and as as your ofsted inspector said it's setting up an environment in which the students want to learn and they want to keep improving for their own for their own internal um, motivational goals. So yeah, I think it's, it's absolutely paramount. Um, what you've just said, there's a great example. Brilliant. And this would be an example in the course where all the different people present would share their ideas. So you'll be learning from James, from the academic experts, but also all the course participants will be learning from each other. This is a, a really practical point, finding, helping students find their motivation, brilliant stuff. And uh, just a, a, a final point on that, if I may. Yes. So the, the, session, the session five is called Motivation and Engagement. 
Um, this isn't often talk, talked about very, um, very fluidly, but motivation and engagement are two separate things. Motivation is, is why you come to an activity, and, and engagement is why you stay in the activity. So also, as teachers, we need to set up engaging learning environments. Uh, as well as offering students the possibility to, to set their own motivation. So these two aspects really dance together very beautifully. I'd like to ask, ask our viewers, James, mm -hmm. what's your motivation for, for learning a language, for teaching a language, for learning whatever you're learning, or for teaching whatever you're teaching, for being interested in psychology? What's your motivation? Type away in the comments. Anything that goes in here, will help James's course, I can confirm that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, also, I, I hope that the question that you just asked, going back to the importance of questions, the question that you just asked will also really help the people that answer it, because it's not an easy question to answer, and you really have to dig deep and, and, and hold that mirror up to yourself and, and examine your own, your own motivations and your own, your own reasons for doing something. And, and, and it's, very, it's a very powerful exercise. It, it really is an important one. Yeah. So uh, this is another one hour. We can talk about this until the cows come home. Number six. Uh, yeah, let's move on to number six, I think. Um, so this one is called the teenage brain. I decided to include this because a lot of teachers I know um, of... of a variety of ages, from from twenty two year old teachers who who are just out of university, so they have only been <clears throat> out of teenagehood for a few years themselves, to so teachers who are who are much older. Um, a lot of teachers come to me and they say I have a huge problem with this teenage student or this group of teenagers, and <clears throat> so of course, my first thought when 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 somebody comes to me with this issue, is I could go straight to the what, which is the outside um, layer of the circle, and I could just give you some activities that work for me. But it's much more interesting and much more useful in the long term to go to the why. Why are teenagers um, often, not always, but often challenging students? So what, what's happening for them? And I think when you start to understand, I mean, we've all been teenagers, so we don't always remember it that well, but when you start to understand the mechanisms and the, especially the brain um, development in the teenage years and what that means for their behavior and their attitudes, then at least you can empathize and be what, what teachers often perceive as a personal attack on them is, 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 is not that whatsoever. It's, it's just it's part of their teenage development process, um, you're just the person who's, who's there in front of them. Um, so yeah, there's, mu there's much to say about that. There's really useful information, um, very, very applicable um, neuroscience, uh, talking about neurotransmitters, uh, hormones, how people act and, and how we perceive them most importantly from our adult perspective. Um, is, is, is most of the time not what they intend to show. So um, I think this session, I think they're all useful useful sessions, but I think this session has been really useful for many for many people. Good stuff. Uh, just, to, just to ask, not, not to challenge, but the principles and ideas uh, transferable mm -hmm. to different younger ages, older ages? What about different levels? Uh, general or more specifically just for teenagers, um, James? This session particularly, I would say it's, it's mostly for the teenagers because there is so much to, to dive into uh, you know from let's say from from 12 to 17 you know you you bring a 12 year old and a 17 year old together in the same class and you may as well be teaching different different creatures <laughs> 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 um so yeah th this session is, is very much focused on that age even in the the 90 minutes that we have for that session um once we've looked at some 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 key information, some, some key knowledge, and then we've applied it to how we may react in different situations, or we'll, we'll, we'll do a bit of troubleshooting in this session, which is really enjoyable. Here's the situation. Now, knowing what you know, what's, what's your response going to be? 
Uh, and I'll, I'll also share a little spoiler alert. I'll also share my experience as a teenager. So I, I speak from firsthand experience. Um, teenagers can can act in a terrible way and not be terrible people. If that's not a reason to join the course, I don't know what is. <laughs> the, the spike, the spike in, in, in the carrot. Yeah, the, the spike in signups just for session six after this. <laughs> One million viewers. <laughs> <laughs> to completely change yeah, yeah. the topic, James, got to stay on task. What do Wonder Woman and Rocky have to do with beating exam anxiety in session seven? <laughs> I mean, maybe we could ask our, our viewers to type in some possible answers before we give the game away. Yeah, we're going to give you ten seconds. One, Rocky, seconds. Rocky, Wonder Woman, and exam anxiety. Hmm. What could it be? Gonna have to go and find some images to put on on screen. <laughs> so, Rocky and Wonder Woman exam anxiety. So, as you know, Al, these are both examples of what Amy Cuddy, um, in her TED talk, calls power poses. And the idea of these power poses is that you hold them for two minutes. And the so especially when you're overly anxious, we'll come back to this point in a moment. When you're overly anxious, these power poses will help to calm you down. And there are neurotransmitter, there are reasons in the neurotransmitters. For example, it will reduce your test, uh, excuse me, reduce your cortisol, which is often associated with stress, increase your testosterone, in this case, associated, associated with self confidence. So just by holding these. Poses for two minutes, that's the recommended time. If you're going into a presentation or if you're going into a lesson that you're really nervous about or whatever it may be, even into an exam, then um, you know, finding a quiet space and, and, and trying out one of these is one tool. It's not the only one. We're going to be talking about many actionable tools to um, deal with anxiety. Just a point on that. So anxiety is up to a certain point, a great help in priming us for activity. So we often want to see the world in black and white, but it, it's not the case. And we want to think anxiety bad. No, wrong. So there's this thing, maybe you can find the image out, called the yerkes dodson curve. <clears throat> if you have no anxiety, your performance is very low. It's, 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 it's kind of an inverted U shape curve with anxiety on the bottom, performance on the side. So, for example, if I wake you up at four o'clock in the morning and I say, oh, let's do a podcast, your quote unquote anxiety, so your arousal, that's another word for it, is extremely low in that moment. I'm guessing. I don't, I don't know about your <laughs> speech patterns. But... <laughs> pick, pick a time that you're just very drowsy, you're not really with it. You're, you're not going to perform well in anything you do. So the idea that low arousal, low anxiety is always a good thing is nonsense because there's an extreme there in which it will be completely devastating for whatever you're trying to do. The other side of, of, of the coin is the extreme that we often refer to when we're talking about too much anxiety, which is when you're overly stressed, you're overthinking it, and you, you have all these physi physiological clues to tell you you maybe start sweating. You can definitely feel your heart rate going. Your prefrontal cortex shuts down. So simple decision making becomes very difficult. Some people forget simple facts about themselves, like right? their address. It gets to in a very extreme, extreme uh, case. And so you can't do what you had set out to do, like take the exam, for example. And so we have to be looking at both these extremes. <clears throat> and our objective in both cases is to get to the top of this inverted U, to get to the optimal balance of anxiety and arousal. And we want to be standing proud at the top of that inverted U and performing the best that we can in whatever we're doing. And performance could be anything from, you know, meeting somebody new and wanting to have a, a really engaging conversation to teaching a lesson that you're you're nervous about it anything a job interview 
Um, for me, it'll be marathon running, like the morning of the marathon. I, I, I go too far on the anxiety scale and I have to pull myself back. So we'll be looking at really, really actionable tools that you can not only use yourself, but also share with your students. There's a lot of breathing techniques um, as well that will help you to go, we say, left or right on the, on the curve. So if, you, if you're breathing in heavily, <clears throat> and this is, all, this, this is not um, pseudoscience, this is you know, straight out the best, the best I was neuroscience. Really asked about that. Yeah, it's um, so Andrew Huberman, who we'll mention in, in session eight, uh, he's a huge proponent of this. Um, he's a neuroscientist professor at, a neuroscience professor at Stanford, for example. So very, very briefly, if you're breathing, if you're doing a breathing exercise, which is predominantly um, inhale heavy, so inhale heavy, you're increasing your arousal. So you're going right on this Yerkes-Bodson curve. On the other hand, the inverse is true. If you're doing some sort of breathing exercise where the exhale is heavy, so then you're going to be shifting your physiology left on this Yerkes-Bodson curve. So that's a fantastic tool if you're overly stressed or overly aroused. Um, but, um, we'll, we'll look at that. It's all about physiology. I find this fascinating because I apply this not just to, to my, my personal life and my professional life, but also to my, my, sport, my sporting life. Um, once you understand the mechanisms of physiology, uh, you can then apply simple tools to get you into a place that you'd like to be at, to, to perform at your, at your best. Good. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. One, one thing I remember, I can't remember if it was session seven or eight, was the idea of the pre-mortem rather than the post-mortem. Mm. Uh, that the pre-mortem, I believe, is you anticipate what's going to, <coughs> excuse me, what might go wrong before it goes wrong, and you put in actionable steps before that. And the, the conversations that I, I think happened in our session about this was just great because this is so... If you just stop to think, well, what can go wrong contemporaneously rather than retrospectively? Brilliant. Uh, that's yeah, one of the takeaways I remember. Yeah, that's huge. But you're right, Al. That's, that's also part of it. So plan ahead. And plan ahead a couple of weeks in advance. Let's just take the example of an exam. <clears throat> if this exam doesn't go well for you in two weeks, really put it in your mind's eye. Visualize what has gone wrong. And then you still have time to fix these things. If, if you've done CELTA, you'll be familiar with the, with the planning process and you have to write about anticipated problems. And this is the reason why we get you to do anticipated problems and then anticipated solutions for a lesson, because you should be planning ahead. And just to circle back very briefly to the L2 um, motivational self system by Dornier that will be in session five, motivation and engagement. One of his, one of the aspects of his framework actually applies that to identity. So, who do you want to be with the second language? This is your your heaven to strive for. Who do you not want to be with the language? So, this is analogous to your, um, you know, who, what you want to avoid. This is analogous to your pre mortem. What what is it that you want to avoid, and how can you avoid? getting there so like we said before you've got a, a heaven to strive for and a little hell to avoid you've got a pull and a push um but yeah i'm glad you remember that it's, um... yeah i enjoy it james just before we get into uh, session eight which is the final session of the psychology 101 for elt course could you again please remind viewers uh what they should be doing next if, if they're interested in this course if they want to sign up What's their call to action? What's their next call? Could you please Absolutely. just highlight that for us? Yeah, pleasure. So um, the, the course starts tomorrow, Tuesday, the 22nd of June, and it's on Tuesdays and Thursdays. My email is the first place to go if you're interested in doing all of that course or even just parts. You can pick, as, as we said at the beginning, you can pick odd sessions, even just one or two. Some people have picked four or five of the sessions. 
and, and there are pricing options for you if you want to do the full course or if you just want to do uh, a few aspects. Um, I think it's, it's very reasonable for everybody. So yep, my email's there. Get in touch with me. If, you're not in, if you can't for whatever reason commit this summer and you're interested, no problem at all. Also get in touch by email. Just let me know when will be a good time because I'm, I'm looking to schedule the next reincarnation of this course possibly in the September, October period. So if you know that you'll be interested in doing it in September, let me know and I'll, I'll be happy to base the course around you know, the, the people that, that contact me first. Fantastic. I, thank you for the clarification. This, this podcast is for those who are watching in the premiere, also for those of you who are in the replay. Everyone is welcome. This course is not a one-off. We just needed to, to clarify that. Session eight, please, James. Yes. So this is completely new from the course that, that we did together ah, in Riga. Yeah. Uh, this is information that I've come across thanks to the Huberman podcast. Um, Huber, sorry, the Huberman Lab podcast, which has just started this year. Um, so session eight, before I go on, <laughs> is optimizing revision technique. Um, without giving away, uh, giving the game away. Again. Um, <laughs> yeah. Nobody will, nobody will need to come to the course after listening to this podcast. Disagree. 100% disagree. <laughs> disagree. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, so Huberman, Andrew Huberman is, is a fantastic neuroscientist. And, and actually, I, I share much of his motivation um, as an educator because he is, as I said before, a neuroscience and ophthalmology, so eye health professor at Stanford University. And his passion and the reason he started his podcast is that he wants to popularize neuroscience and provide people with actionable tools to use, to use the science in their everyday lives, to improve their everyday lives. And I suppose that's what we're trying to do on this course as well. We're trying to, of course, take the information in, in its purest form. Also, you know, there is a strong academic aspect to, to everything that we'll look at during this course. But most importantly, put the theory into practice. And, 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 and that's why he started his podcast this year. Uh, he's, he's been on many podcasts before. I've seen him so many times and I've always been really impressed about how he translates often um, unreadable academic studies into everyday English and how he then translates this into actionable tools protocols um absolutely, absolutely and and that's what we're trying to do on this course so this one this this session this final session optimizing revision technique is is based on some information that he shared on his podcast how long should you re be revising uh in each session what kind of um let's say um external uh, aids can help and hinder you. For example, a lot of people think, oh, I need to take loads of coffee before I, I study. Wrong. I don't, I, I'm not going to say any more now. We'll find but... out, you'll find out why. That's another and teaser. It's... You want to know why you shouldn't take coffee to revise? <laughs> Join the course. You actually want to take coffee at the end, but the, the reasons for that, um, and then what you should be doing at the end of a learning session or a vision session in order to increase the possibility that what you've just studied is then remembered is absolutely fascinating. And as we sort of touched on before in, in, in another, um, in another right. example, yeah, it goes back to evolution, evolutionary biology. The reason that we remember things and the reason that we forget things is even in 2021 with all the technology around us, it's to survive. We still have the same mechanisms. So understanding those mechanisms uh, and, and putting them to action, even as even into something as seemingly um, irrelevant or, you know, if we're talking about survival, seemingly irrelevant as, as passing an exam uh, or optimizing your revision sessions is, is really important. It's, it's, yeah. so, th so this is the kind of information that I came across and I just, it just left me open mouth. It was just like, wow. So I'm going to be sharing that and how we can, how we can help our students with that. Brilliant. I want to ask the viewers again, <clears throat> excuse me, in the, in the premiere, what's your experience of effective revision techniques for you or your students? What are your experiences of dealing with exam anxiety for yourself? 
or for your students. Any of the other sessions we've talked about, memory, attention, mindset theory, motivation, engagement, absolutely anything, James is really wanting to hear from you. Uh, this is, a, this is a, an ever-moving, adapting, progressing course. The course is a growth mindset course, as we spoke about earlier. So you have any comments, any questions about this course, absolutely get in, get in touch with us right now. It's over here, over here. I can't remember which side, but YouTube will sort that out. Yeah, that's, that's it, Al. Practice like, what you preach. That's something yeah. that we both believe. So, yeah, and I'm, 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 always, I'm always keen to, to learn more and to improve what I'm doing. So, yeah, please, please get in touch. Now, on that note about learning, we're just going to slow down for a minute or so because, again, there's some theory in there. If there's no takeaway from this podcast, we've failed you. And, and hands up. Um, yeah, James and I are passionate about this. If, there's, if you're not taking away from this, this is a waste of time and we apologize. So we're going to ask ourselves first uh, and all the viewers for one takeaway from this podcast. I'm going to give maybe 45 seconds to think. James and I will think. We'll share with each other. If you put yours in the comments, please the comments or in the live chat. What's your takeaway from this podcast? One thing. And just as you're thinking, we don't want this podcast to have been a failure. We don't want this course to be some academic idea that doesn't have a have a practical point. So we need to clarify that. What's your what's your takeaway from the podcast? Let's have, let's have a think. James and I don't do uncomfortable silences, by the way. We're both entirely comfortable for all the viewers. We're very I'm, happy I'm I could give you my heart rate readout right now. Al. It's, perfect. it's perfectly fine. It's stable. I'm about 75. That's, I think that's a healthy amount. Yeah, we're fine. Well, that's another I, thing. <laughs> Silence. Giving, Adrian Underhill calls it um, giving, allowing students to use their inner workbench. So... If you're asking hard questions, don't expect somebody to come up with an answer in half a second. Give people time to think and reflect and really wrestle with these ideas. If they're worth wrestling with, then it needs time. I'm ready to share mine. Is that okay? Yeah, please go ahead. My one actionable takeaway, it gets to the why, and it's about the gap. So some time ago, James spoke about why he was promoting and using this course and he identified that there was a gap there was a need in teacher training psychology is everywhere and the psychology required for teaching and learning isn't covered in teacher training courses i'm inspired to think well is there a gap that i should be attacking <laughs> that's the way of putting it uh, why am i doing what i'm what i'm doing am i just doing what everybody else is doing or is there a gap is there a niche that i'm that I'm working towards. I didn't explain that very well. Apologies. So no, I, I, think think that, I, I think that's my takeaway. I got the message, yeah. But that's what happens when you're forming new thoughts. You know, it's not going to be smooth as silk first time around, but you get the message across. I'm sure all these comments over here are much better than, than that. But what, what about <laughs> you, James? Is there, I know you've been giving us the information really today, but is, is there something maybe it's a takeaway for you? Well, there is actually. And, and I'd like to thank you again for having me on, on the podcast because talking through the the contents even if we're just sort of bouncing over the main topics uh, briefly because each of these sessions is, is an hour and a half of material which is actually a decade and a half of material in each but we have to condense it into an hour and a half um even even the hour or so that we spent in conversation it, it's really helped me to see how everything is intertwined so there is a theory and second language acquisition that's becoming more and more popular called dynamic systems theory, DST. And it basically um, says that we're all made up of hundreds of internal and external factors that are extremely 
um, chaotic, extremely intertwined, and they change over time. So I'm sure you're familiar now with chaos theory from mathematics. It, it comes from that. And, 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 and this is no different. We're not treating each of these things as isolated. Your mindset will affect your attention. Your, your, your group dynamics will affect your motivation. How you revise and how you do on subsequent um, exams will also affect your and exam anxiety. For, like they're all intertwined. Like we, we can't be rigid about this. Like we're, we're treating the person, the student as a whole person. And, and if we start to also observe ourselves, we'll see that there are so many moving parts to this. And this is why it's a fascinating topic to dive into. James Edgerton, thank you so much for, for being here. It's been an absolute privilege for me and for all the viewers. What's the call to action, please? So the call for action again, um, if you're interested in, in getting onto the course, the whole course, it starts tomorrow, Tuesday, the 22nd of June. The course dates are in the, the link. It's basically over the next four to five weeks on Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, in the evening. So if you're interested, the first thing I would do is don't think too much. Just get in touch with me by my email and um, we'll talk it through. If you have any doubts, get in touch by email. We'll talk it through. If you're interested in a future course, get in touch by email. We'll talk it through. Um, and, and, and yeah, get involved. And, 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 and I'm really looking forward to working with with you all on the course. If, if it's not this course this summer, then, then a future course perhaps in the autumn. Um, I'm, I'm really passionate about this. This is not a flash in the pan for me. It's something that I, that I believe in and that I've believed in for many years. And so I'm really happy to be able to put it into action. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Al's Action English with James Edgerton. This has been Psychology 101 for ELT course. Thank you to all the viewers. Thank you to James. And he looks forward to seeing you on the course. Peace. And thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone.